Hello listeners, this is the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the fourth and final quarter of 2024. Yes, and welcome to the reading of lesson number seven from the Gospel of John. It's titled, Blessed Are Those Who Believe, and is ready for teaching on November 16. Our authors this quarter are Edward Zinke and Thomas R. Shepherd, and your reader today is Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, November 9. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this book of John, which tells us so much about who Jesus is, what he did, and the results of what he did, and how that we can have salvation. We thank you as we open your word that your Holy Spirit can guide our thinking, guide our reading, guide our understanding. And now, as we open your word, we pray that you will be with us and our families wherever we are in the world at this time, as we listen to the reading of the Sabbath school lesson for this week. And particularly today, I'd like to pray for Omo Boriowo Ibukan and his wife in Ghana. Uh, Omo uh, listens on the Sabbath school app and his wife uh, listens and watches on YouTube. And for Twiggy Wills in Zambia. And for Jester Mafisa and Claudio Frexis from Eureka in California and his family, Lord. And particularly for those who are vision impaired who are listening to this service, and for all of our Sabbath school teachers. Lord, wherever we are, wherever we live, we pray a blessing on our families and on our influence in the world around us. Open our eyes, open our ears this week, that we may be blessed as one of those who believe. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is John chapter 20 and verse 26. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And to read our memory verse for the second time today is Anato Brady. Anato is the father of two and as a motor mechanic has retrained as a nurse. Thank you, Anato. John twenty twenty nine, Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Throughout his gospel, John has a diversity of people, people with different backgrounds, beliefs and experiences, all testifying to who Jesus was. Behold the Lamb of God in John one thirty six. We have found the Messiah in John one forty one. We have found him of whom Moses wrote in John one forty five. Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel in John one forty nine. Could this be the Christ in John four verse twenty eight? We ourselves have heard of him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Saviour of the world. John 4, verse 42. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. John 6, verse 68. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. John 11, 27. Though I was blind, now I see. John 9.25 Behold your King, John 19.14 I find no fault in him, John 19, verse 6 My Lord and my God, John 20, verse 28 Who were some of these people? And why did they testify as they did to the identity of Jesus? Sunday, November 10, Harking Back to Abraham Jesus was not shy in declaring who he was, nor in calling on witnesses to testify to who he was, even witnesses who were long gone, including Abraham. In John 8.56 we read, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it, and was glad. Why was Abraham's witness so important that it was included in John's Gospel? 
Well, first of all, we look at Genesis chapter 12 and verse 3. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And Genesis 18 verses 6 to 18. When the men got up to leave, they looked down towards Sodom, and Abraham walked along with them to see them on their way. Then the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all nations of earth will be blessed through him. And then Genesis chapter 26 and verse 4. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and will give them all these lands. And through your offspring, all nations of earth will be blessed. And Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. This is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And Acts chapter 3, verse 25. And you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your fathers. He said to Abraham, Through your offspring all peoples on earth will be blessed. We read in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 154, Through type and promise God preached before the gospel unto Abraham. Galatians 3 verse 8 And the Patriarch's faith was fixed upon the Redeemer to come said Christ to the Jews, Your father Abraham rejoiced that he should see my day, and he saw it and was glad. John 8.56, quoted by Ellen White from the Revised Version. Margin. The ram offered in place of Isaac represented the Son of God, who was to be sacrificed in our stead. When man was doomed to death by transgression of the law of God, the father looked upon his son, said to the sinner, Live, I have found a ransom. End of quote. Abraham was the father of a Jewish nation. He received the promise that through him all nations would be blessed. This blessing came through the Messiah, born through his lineage. Abraham was also the father of those who respond to God in faith, as we read in Hebrews 11, verse 8, by faith Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. And then verses 17 to 19, by faith Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, It is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead, and so, in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. His willingness to sacrifice his son Isaac we read about in Genesis chapter 22, the son of promise was not only an evidence of faith, but a window into the plan of salvation. When Jesus said, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, in John 8.56, the leaders responded, You are not yet fifty years old, and have you seen Abraham? In verse 57, Jesus' answer was astounding. Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Verse 58. Jesus uses language reminiscent of what God said to Moses at the burning bush. This was a claim to be God, the self-existent one. No question. The leaders understood the implication of what he said because they then took up stones to throw at him. Let's read that whole story in John 8, verses 56 to 59. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. You were not yet fifty years old, they said to him, and you have seen Abraham. Very truly I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. At this, they picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. And so to finish today, read Romans chapter 4, 
verses 1 to 5. How does Paul use the story of Abraham to reveal the great truth of salvation by faith alone, without the deeds of the law? How do these verses help us understand the idea of Abraham as the father of those who live by faith? Romans 4, beginning at verse 1. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter? If, in fact, Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the one who does not work, but trusts God who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. How does Paul use this story of Abraham to reveal the great truth of salvation by faith alone, without the deeds of the law? How do these verses help us understand the idea of Abraham as the father of those who live by faith? Monday, November 11, The Witness of Mary Six days before Passover, Jesus came to visit Mary, Martha, and their brother Lazarus, whom Jesus had raised to life. Simon, who had been healed of leprosy, hosted a feast in appreciation for what Jesus had done for him. Martha was serving, and Lazarus was sitting at the table with the guests. Let's read about this in John chapter 12, verses 1 to 8. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honour. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. What was the significance of Mary's actions here? How was this a witness to who Jesus really was? Let's read those first three verses again. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honour. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure lard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. The perfume was very expensive, worth about a year's wages for the common labourer. Mary probably brought this gift as an expression of gratitude to the Saviour for the forgiveness of her sins and for the resurrection of her brother. She intended it to be used some day for the burial of Jesus. But then she heard that he would soon be anointed king. In that case, she would be the first to bring him honour. Mary probably did not intend for her gesture to be noticed. But, John notes, the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume, in verse 3. Judas responded with a quick rebuke, stating that the perfume should have been sold and the proceeds given to the poor. Jesus immediately put Mary at ease by stating, Let her alone. The poor you have with you always, but me you do not have always. That's verses 7 and 8. A recurring theme runs through the Gospel. 
Jesus knows what is in people. For instance, in John chapter 2, verses 24 to 25. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all people. He did not need any testimony about mankind, for he knew what was in each person. And John 6, verses 70 and 71. Then Jesus replied, Have I not chosen you, the twelve? Yet one of you is a devil. He meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, who, though one of the twelve, was later to betray him. And John chapter 13, verse 11, For he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said not everyone was clean. And John 16 and verse 19, Jesus saw that they wanted to ask him about this, so he said to them, Are you asking one another what I meant when I said, In a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me? In this instance, at Simon's feast, Jesus knows what is in Judas. John is careful to point out who Judas is, a self-serving thief, we read in verse 6. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. And then we read in Desire of Ages, page 570, The fragrant gift which Mary had thought to lavish upon the dead body of the Saviour, she poured upon his living form. At the burial, its sweetness could only have pervaded the tomb. Now it gladdened his heart with the assurance of her faith and love. And as he went down into the darkness of his great trial, he carried with him the memory of that deed, an earnest of the love that would be his from his redeemed one's forever. End of quote. And so to finish today, Jesus knew what was in the heart of Mary and the heart of Judas. He knows what's in your heart as well. What should this truth tell us about the need of Christ as our righteousness, transforming us and covering us as well? Tuesday, November 12, The Unwitting Witness of Pilate Time and again, John records the attempts of the religious leaders to seize Jesus, to bring him to trial, and to sentence him to death. A theme in John's Gospel, stated often by Jesus, is that his time or hour had not yet come, by which he meant the time for his crucifixion. We read about that so many times. John chapter 2, verse 4. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied. My hour has not yet come. And John 7, verses 6 and 8. Therefore the Lord said to them, My time is not yet here, for you any time will do. You go to the festival. I am not going up to this festival, because my time has not yet come. And verse 30. At this they tried to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. And John chapter 12, verse 7. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. And verse 23, Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And John chapter 12 and verse 27, Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. And John 13 verse 1, It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And chapter 17, verse 1. After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. Now the hour had come. 
Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, brought before Annas, then Caiaphas, the high priest, then twice before Pilate. John has called upon many witnesses from every walk of life to testify that Jesus was the Christ. Now John calls upon Pilate, the governor who tried Jesus. This was an important testimony because Pilate was a Roman, a governor, and a judge. Most of the other witnesses were Jews and commoners. How is Pilate's verdict connected to the theme of John's Gospel? John eighteen thirty eight. What is truth? retorted Pilate. With this he went out again to the Jews, gathered them, and said, I find no basis for a charge against him. And then we read John chapter 19, verses 4 to 22. Once more, Pilate came out and said to the Jews gathered there, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! But Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jewish leaders insisted, We have a law, and according to that law, he must die, because he claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid. And he went back inside the palace. Where do you come from? he asked Jesus. But Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said. Don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? Jesus answered, You would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free. But the Jewish leaders kept shouting, If you let this man go... You are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judge's seat at a place known as the Stone Pavement, which in Aramaic is Gabbatha. It was a day of preparation of the Passover. It was about noon. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, Take him away! Take him away! Crucify him! Shall I crucify your king? Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priests answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. So, the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with two others, one on each side, and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Jesus was brought to Pilate early on Friday morning, as we read in verse 28 of chapter 18. His plan was to dispatch the prisoner quickly to his fate. But Jesus' demeanour drew Pilate's attention. The governor questioned Jesus closely and heard from his lips, For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice, Jesus had said in John 18.37. Though the governor ultimately condemned Jesus to death, he nonetheless three times proclaimed Jesus innocent 
in chapter 18, verse 38, and in chapter 19, verses 4 and 6. And over the cross he wrote the words, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews, in chapter 19, verse 19, completing his witness to who Jesus is. And yet, despite his testimony of Christ's innocence, he nevertheless condemned Jesus to death. Pilate had the truth himself standing before him, and yet, allowing the mob to bully him, Pilate sentenced Jesus to death anyway. What a tragic example of not following what your conscience and heart tell you is correct. And so to finish the day, what can we learn from Pilate's example about the dangers of allowing popular sentiment, even pressure, to keep us from doing what we believe is right. Wednesday, November 13, The Witness of Thomas Read John chapter 20, verses 19 to 31. What can we learn from the story of Thomas about faith and doubt? And... What major mistake did Thomas make? John chapter 20, beginning at verse 19. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he had said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now, Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Christ appeared to the disciples after his resurrection when they were shut up together in a room because of fear. Thomas was not with them. Later, he heard the reports of the resurrection from the other disciples, but he despaired. It did not fit his picture of the kingdom. And two, he surely must have wondered why Jesus would have revealed himself to the others when he himself was not there. Thomas said, Unless I see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. John 20, verse 25. Thomas was dictating the conditions of his faith. This approach to faith in Jesus has appeared again and again in John. Nicodemus answered Jesus with, How can a man be born when he is old? in John chapter 3, verse 4. The woman at the well asked, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? In John 4, verse 11, the crowd who had been fed with the loaves and fishes asked, What sign are you going to give us? In John 6, verse 30, it is this see 
and then believe perspective that the Gospel of John counters. When Jesus met Thomas after the resurrection, he invited him to come, see, and touch his risen body. But then he says, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed, in verse 29. God never asks us to believe without giving sufficient evidence upon which to base our faith, we read in Steps to Christ, page 105. His existence, his character, the truthfulness of his word are all established by testimony that appeals to our reason, and this testimony is abundant. Yet, God has never removed the possibility of doubt. Our faith must rest upon evidence, not demonstration. End of quote. Through the Word of God, through the creation, and through personal experience, we have been given an incredible amount of evidence for our faith in Jesus. And so to finish the day, if someone were to ask you, why do you believe in Jesus? What would you say? Thursday, November 14, Our Witness of Jesus Again and again, as John presents witnesses to Jesus, his point is to bring us to a sweeping conclusion. And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. John 20 verses 30 and 31. Imagine having been there in person, in the flesh, and having seen Jesus do many of these miracles. We'd certainly believe, wouldn't we? We'd like to think so. But in some ways, we have even more reasons to believe in Jesus than did those who actually saw the miracles. Why? What are some of the things that we have today that those living at the time of Jesus didn't have that should help us believe? For example, we'll look at Matthew 24, verse 2. Do you see all these things? he asked. Truly, I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. And Matthew 24, verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. And Matthew 24, verses 6 to 8. You will hear of wars and rumours of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. And that's because we have not only the powerful accounts in John's Gospel, but also the great advantage of seeing so much of what Jesus and other Bible writers predicted would come true, such as the destruction of the temple in Matthew 24 verse 2, the spread of the gospel around the world in verse 14, the great falling away of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 3, don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. And the world continuing to be a fallen and evil place, as we read in Matthew 24 verses 6 to 8. All during the life and ministry of Jesus, his following remained a small and harassed group of men and women who, by all human standards, should have vanished from history a long time ago. How could they have known, as we do, that all these things would come to pass? And they have. In fact, our own faith itself exists as a fulfilment of Jesus' own prophecy that the gospel would go to all the world. And today, about 2,000 years later, as followers of Jesus, we also have the privilege of bearing witness to Jesus and to what he has done for us. It is not by the reasoning of Nathaniel, Nicodemus, the woman of Samaria, or the teachings of the Pharisees that we can know Jesus as the Messiah for ourselves. 
It is the reading of the Scriptures under the convicting power of the Holy Spirit that we accept Jesus as the Saviour of the world. And then each one of us, in our way, and out of our relationship with God, can have a story to tell. Our story may not be as dramatic as seeing the dead raised or someone blind from birth healed, but that doesn't matter. What matters is that we know Jesus for ourselves, and in our own way, bear witness to him, as did those in John's Gospel. Friday, November 15. Further thought. Thomas cast himself at the feet of Jesus, crying, My Lord and my God. Ellen White writes in The Desire of Ages, page 807 and 808, the following. Jesus accepted his acknowledgement, but gently reproved his unbelief. Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. The faith of Thomas would have been more pleasing to Christ if he had been willing to believe upon the testimony of his brethren. Should the world now follow the example of Thomas, no one would believe unto salvation, for all who receive Christ must do so through the testimony of others. Many who are given to doubt excuse themselves by saying that if they had the evidence which Thomas had from his companions, they would believe. They do not realize that they have not only that evidence, but much more. Many who, like Thomas, wait for all cause of doubt to be removed, will never realize their desire. They gradually become confirmed in unbelief. Those who educate themselves to look on the dark side and murmur and complain know not what they do. They are sowing the seeds of doubt and they will have a harvest of doubt to reap. At a time when faith and confidence are most essential, many will thus find themselves powerless to hope and believe. End of quote. And that brings us to our four discussion questions for this week. 1. What was the essential difference in the expressions of faith by Abraham and by Thomas? What can we learn from their stories? 2. In class, let those who are willing bear witness to Jesus as we have seen done in the Gospel of John. Though the accounts differ, what do people say? And how do they all bear witness to the same Lord? 3. Pilate asked a very philosophical question. What is truth? Give your answer to that question in light of all we've studied in John. And question 4. Look at the prophecies of Daniel 2 and 7. Though those in the time of Jesus had these two chapters, what great advantage do we have today that they didn't have back then in terms of seeing those prophecies fulfilled and thus having even more reasons to believe? And reading our inside story, our mission story for this week is Sibylla Harold. Thank you, Sibylla. From Pin Trader to Camper by Andrew McChesney. Jacob Pierce's whole family loved trading pins, and they fanned out to find new pins at the International Pathfinder Campery in the United States. Then Mother saw a man with an Alaska pin. Knowing that Jacob loved Alaskan nature, she tried to convince the man to make a trade. I can't trade, he said. It's a -a one-of-a-kind pin for pastors in Alaska. Mother's interest only grew. What do you do up in Alaska, she asked. The man introduced himself as Tobin Dodge, director of Alaska Camps, a mission incentive of the Seventh-day Adventist Church's Alaska Conference, which sponsors camps for children ages 8 to 17 every summer. Could my son work there, Mother asked. Yes, we take counsellors in training at age 16 and counsellors at 18, he said. Jacob jumped at the idea of spending the summer in Alaska. He joined the camp staff and went three years in a row. The camp experience can be challenging, he said. One year he enjoyed spending time with an Alaskan native boy at Camp Polaris, located on Lake 
El Ganaki in southwestern Alaska. They shared an interest in nature and climbed Jackknife Mountain, which looms above the camp. But the boy refused to behave. He also used vulgar language and seemed more interested in promoting superstitions than hearing Bible truth. He blamed a rainy day on a boy who had killed a spider, saying, if you kill a spider, it rains. Jacob grew frustrated, but at the end of camp, the boy gave Jacob a hug and walked over to his father. As he watched the two, Jacob suddenly began to understand the boy's behaviour. The boy was practically raising himself. Most of the kids don't have any Christian background at all, Jacob, 20, said in an interview at Camp Polaris. That's what makes it really an eye-opener and to me an amazing mission field. He said the spiritual battles at Camp Polaris are different from those at other summer camps sponsored by the Alaska Conference because it is comprised almost entirely of Alaska Native children who often face struggles with trauma, superstition and substance abuse. But being here is worth it, he said. It is a calling that is stronger than any that I have seen. God really needs volunteers here. This is a mission field. Thank you for your 2016 13th Sabbath offering that helped repair and expand Camp Polaris so more children could attend. Part of this quarter's 13th Sabbath offering will help open a centre of influence at the Adventist Church in Bethel, Alaska. The Bethel Church sends local children to Camp Polaris every year.